Okay, you guys, welcome to One Mind Brainwaves. I'm Lori Hernandez, guest hosting for Brandon Staglin this week. One of the most famous examples is Mozart, the 18th century classical composer, but child prodigies can be found in many fields, from all branches of the arts to math, sports, and chess, and who didn't catch the last part of the Queen's Gambit series? We're fascinated here by child prodigies, but what do we really know about the prodigy brain? What can science tell us? We'll find out more today when we talk with one of the foremost experts on gifted children, Dr. Ellen Winner. And later in the program, we'll check in with our team at One Mind Cyber Guide for a mental health app review of the week. At the age of 11, he started performing all over the world in major concert venues such as Madison Square Garden and the Hollywood Bowl. He made his television debut even earlier, rocking the Ellen DeGeneres show at the age of seven. And by nine, he was talking with Oprah. He's now considered a gifted adult, and we are so lucky to have him here to perform for us today. Amazingly talented singer-songwriter, guitarist, and friend of the program, Quinn Sullivan. Welcome back to Brainwaves. Thank you so much for having me again. It's great to see all you guys. Yeah. Now, music brings people together, and despite being physically apart, it's helped us all get through the last year. So what have you been up to since you were last year and Brainwaves in May? I've been up to a few things. Um, actually, I finished my album, which I'm really excited about. That um, is coming out on June 4th. So um, that's really exciting. Um, <clears throat> but luckily, I actually had finished most of the album pre-pandemic. So the only things I really had to do were like last minute overdubs and things like that. So um, I spent like the first two months doing that sort of thing. And then, you know, as the pandemic sort of began to unfold, I found myself uh wondering when shows are coming back. And I think all musicians, we're kind of, we're kind of all in the same boat where it's like we, we have so much of our time is spent playing around the world or where, wherever we're doing. And uh, so we're not able to do that this year. So it was definitely an adjustment for me, but um, you know, uh, we're, we're trying to make the best of it. So we're hoping to see some, some of that stuff coming back soon. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. I know in terms of like being an athlete and competing this year and not having a crowd, it definitely changes the energy of things. So yeah, I hope absolutely. just for pure excitement and, and pure love that you get that crowd energy back soon and, and that everybody gets to stay safe and doing it and, and that joy, you know, gets fueled again. Absolutely. I cannot agree more. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us about the new single you just released, How Many Tears. How has the time and space of the past year affected your creative process? Um, you know, it's actually, um, it's funny. Um, a lot of the songs or actually all of the songs that were written for the new album were all written before any of this happened, um, you know, with COVID and stuff. So luckily I, I was in a, a different headspace two years ago than I obviously ended up being in now. And, um, you know, I think it's, a, I think seeing the world unfold and not even just with the pandemic, but with all of the other uh, you know, social issues that we face today and all of the, all of the issues around the world that we face. It's, it's sort of, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's woken everybody up on, on different situations. And um, so, yeah, I mean, that's affected, I think my writing and, and how I, how I'm going about writing songs now. And, you know, I, I mean, I guess my process hasn't really changed much, I guess it's kind of remained pretty much the same, but um you know, definitely thinking a lot more, you know, especially um, lyrically, you know, so, yeah. Sweet. Would you like to play it for us now? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do a little bit of it. It's called uh, How Many Tears? It goes like this. How could he treat you so bad? Baby, I've seen this movie oh one too many times. You keep saying, Maybe one day I'll do you right. I just want to know how many more tears can one girl cry. I don't know how to make you want me And I don't know if I should even try Cause baby you're still waiting, still waiting Hoping to do you right I just wanna know how many more tears can one girl cry Girl you ought to know Love don't need 
to hurt like that Baby, you should know You can find a better You can find a better man I'm so dumb being child Tell me, baby Tell me what it's gonna take What it's gonna take To make you realize so good <laughs> oh, thank you very much yeah. no i think like thank you for sharing that with us i think especially because of quarantine any kind of creative process any kind of art that people can share with I, those listening and watching i it, totally it, agree thank you so much i appreciate that though <laughs> yeah we're so excited because you are going to stick around and share some of your story with us so Absolutely. definitely can't wait let's get to it Joining us now to talk about the science behind child prodigies, Dr. Ellen Winner is a professor of psychology at Boston College and the senior research associate for Project Zero at Harvard's Graduate School of Education. She is also the author of several books, including Gifted Children, Myths, and Realities. Viewers, don't forget, you can post thoughts or questions for our guests in the comments section of this webcast at any time. Ellen, thank you so much for joining us on Brainwaves. Delighted to be here. And that was wonderful, Quinn. Ah, oh, thank you so much. Appreciate that. And you say the brains of gifted children are atypical. What makes the prodigy brain different from that of a typical child? And how are typical children and those with pretty just talent different cognitively? Well, you know, I actually wouldn't say that the brains of child prodigies are atypical because we know almost nothing about the brains of child prodigies. But we know a lot about the minds of child prodigies. And their, their emotions, their feelings, their behaviors, and how to recognize child prodigies. And those are all atypical. So I think um, it would be fascinating to put child prodigies in a brain scanner and look at their brains and figure out what's atypical about them. I'm sure there are atypical things about them, but right now I'm not gonna talk about the brain. I'm just going to talk about the mind, which is of course linked to the brain. Um, in my work, I define a child prodigy as somebody who has three characteristics. First is they're precocious, meaning they start doing something at a very young age at a level that's way above their peers. And I'm sure Quinn, I would love to hear your story, but I'm sure that you started doing things musically that were recognized as atypically advanced. You can tell us more about this, I hope. Yes. Or maybe yeah. you'd like to just chime in right here. Yeah. Can I ask Quinn a question or do I just answer questions, Lori? Of, of course, yeah. Okay, so Quinn, let's, let's just, I've got three things to talk about here about prodigies. Precocity is the first. How precocious were you? How early did you start doing things and what were you doing? Well, I, yeah, like you were, like you were saying, I started playing guitar at a really young age. I was three years old when I first picked up my first uh, guitar. And 
Um, you know, my parents, uh, you know, they're huge music lovers and they loved music growing up. You know, their childhood was, was very musical based too. My dad plays drums. So, um, you know, he was a musician. And so, yeah, music was always floating around in my house. So about like three years old, I think it was a Christmas and they bought me um, a little toy guitar for me to play. And um, yeah, I, I guess I just um, gravitated towards it. You know, I don't really know, I can't really pinpoint what it was. I think it was more of a visual thing for me at that time in my life, you know, cause I, I really, um, you know, I was kind of just doing normal stuff that three-year-olds do, you know, like take, you know, going, going to uh, the jungle gym with my parents and, you know, playing with kids. But like, I guess it became something where, um, the music part of it, like just listening to music and watching people play on stage. You know, I was a big fan of like the Beatles growing up. So watching them play like on the Ed Sullivan show on, on like a VHS tape or whatever I had, um, that just intrigued me. Like it just, it kind of just blew my mind. And I was just like, wow, like that, that is just, it's like, you can't explain how that makes you feel. It's just, it's just this really, uh, crazy experience that I had. So yeah, I, I just, um, I started to play around with it a little bit once I got it and, but I didn't really start taking it seriously until I was like a few years later at like five, six, um, you know, beginning to take lessons and stuff mm -hmm. full time and get more involved with it. Um, but it definitely, you know, the guitar, um, I like to kind of separate the guitar and my voice because I felt like the vo my voice, my vocals took a lot longer to develop and, and get to know. Um, but the guitar part of it definitely came um, pretty natural to me. You know, I just had a natural inkling for it. I just um, always wanted to do it. And I did it a lot, too, as a kid. I remember I, I spent a lot of time in the house playing. So probably, okay, that, probably more than I should have. <laughs> that actually brings me to my next characteristic. But I want to first just say something about what you said. You said you were a typical child going to the jungle gym, etc. But you had this, you were taken by music and taken by your guitar and you were focused on them and it grabbed your attention. And that's really typical because prodigies have one area usually they're very uh, advanced in, but then in other areas, they're like a typical kid running around on the jungle gym. Exactly. Um, yeah. And the second characteristic I was gonna talk about is something that I call a rage to master, which means um, you can't stop a child like you from doing their thing. And you said you spent a lot of time on, on the guitar. I mean, I've studied children who uh, were drawing prodigies and they drew during school. They drew when they had friends over, they asked their friends to pose for them. They drew during breakfast, they drew at night when they were supposed to be going to bed. They're constantly working, developing their skill because they get flow from it. It's pleasurable because they, it comes easily to them. Right. And so it's, so it's, can you tell us a bit about whether you had this kind of rage to master? Yeah, I mean, I definitely remember um, being a kid and like, you know, when I'd see like friends of mine getting into sports or getting into, you know, because like most kids, I feel like when you grow up, you're introduced to like baseball, you play Little League or, you know, you do things that a lot of kids do. Um, and for me, I live, like I was saying, I live in, I live in such a musical family, you know, and we, yeah. and we love music so much. And you know, it's a big part of, it was a big part of my life growing up. So um, I guess like, you know, they would play me like certain concerts and I, I would be so like mesmerized, like, you know, they show me like, um, you know, I remember watching like old, like Carlos Santana videos and Eric Clapton videos and, and things like that. So, you know, that was just such a, uh, to me, it just, it felt, it felt so natural and so right for me to just naturally just, just start to play guitar and just to get into it because people were just, you know, sort of uh, in my household, just always like, it was always around. So, yeah, I mean, you know, but like I was saying, um, you know, it really didn't become a thing that I had to practice until I started taking lessons. And then, you know, my guitar teacher would show me different chords on the guitar and he, you know, and then eventually I would be learning songs. So, you know, it definitely, um, it became, you know, it became more work as I, as I began to get into it more. But, um, but then again, it, it also, it was, I was a quick learner, I think with it, you know, so. Did your parents have to force you to practice? They did not. No, there was never any like, you know, regimen of like, you need to practice, you know, for five hours a day. I mean, I, I think everybody's different, you know, and I guess it, it, it depends on the instrument. 
And, you know, I guess it depends on, you know, what, what, you know, what I, it all depends on person to person. And I, I always stress to like younger kids that are picking up an instrument, whether it's guitar or piano or drums is to never over practice, because I think, you know, there's an element of overdoing it where if, if you're overdoing it, it then becomes unnatural and not enjoyable. And that, that was just from my experience with it. So definitely um, it's important to practice every day and, and to, to play your instrument and, and to, to get it going. But um, yeah, I think the over-practicing thing is a little bit um, over, overly over-exaggerated, or over-exaggerated sometimes. So. so you did, you practiced voluntarily because you, it came easy to you. You were a quick learner and I guess you probably loved it and nobody was pushing you. So I think that's important for everybody to keep in mind. That's what I call a rage to master is that you're driven to do it. Your parents aren't forcing you with a whip. You got to do your practicing. You're driving yourself. Absolutely. The third, the third characteristic, I wonder if you could relate to this, is something that I call marching to your own drummer. And the prodigies that I've studied, they don't mind the fact that they're different from other kids, that they have different interests. Um, they just go right along with their own interests. And they also, another aspect of marching to your own drummer is that kids like you, I think, learn differently. And the main way they learn differently is they teach themselves. They're primarily, I mean, I know that teachers are important, but they also do a lot of self-teaching. Yeah. Yeah, I did a lot of that too. I was going to say, yeah, I did a lot of um, self-teach. I was self-taught, you know, from, from, I was playing, you know, by the time I was seven, eight years old, I was sort of teaching myself how to play songs and um, didn't really, found myself not really needing much help from mm -hmm. other outside people. Um, and I don't know if that, I think part of that was because I had started so early and I, I'd had it, I'd have it in my hands, you know, at three years old, just strumming along. And, you know, I also forgot to mention too, that my parents would also take me to a lot of like local shows that would happen mm -hmm. around my area. I live in uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts. So there was a lot of, um, there was a kid's band actually that came to play um, my local zoo every single Monday. And before I had gotten to kindergarten, I had all the time in the world to pretty much do whatever I wanted. So they would take me every Monday at like noon to go see this, this kids band play. And I'd watch all the kids playing, you know, it was like they'd play these like fun songs, kid oriented, family friendly songs. And, uh, you know, instead of like playing with the kids in the crowd, I would be on stage playing with the with the band, you know, and I and that was like you were saying, like, you know, kids don't. Uh, you know, pro quote unquote prodigies don't um, don't mind having their own interests. Um, yeah, I, I did not mind at all because I think I was so enthralled with the guitar. I was so enthralled with um, being on stage. I just felt like that that was so exciting to me just from a young age. I just um, and I haven't been able to uh, get another feeling the way I do when I'm on stage playing. It's, it's the best feeling for me in the world. So I think it's called flow. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, it was just, um, it was very natural right from the start. Yeah. Okay. Well, Lori, I think we've clinched it. He fits my three criteria. Because now you're an adult. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I was actually pretty curious, like, to know when did you first start writing songs and, and what that process was like for you? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I consider like these, these, so these three things about me, like I'm a singer, I'm a songwriter, I'm a guitar player. I kind of see them as separate things, you know, because I was known as a guitar player for the first, you know, eight or ten, eight to ten years of my career. I was like, you know, guitar prodigy, guitar phenom. I was called all of these things. I was on Ellen. I did all of this stuff, and it was all so so great, and and absolutely no regrets. But there's a kind of a point that I got to, and I've kind of talked to some other people that are kind of in a similar position to me. You get to a point where you want to be, you want to start being taken more seriously as an artist. And the, you know, sometimes the word prodigy can sort of, you know, become almost like a novelty act. And I never wanted to become a novelty act, like, because along the way, you know, as I play shows and this is, I'm talking now like 13, 14, 15 years old, you know, kind of fast forward a little bit. Um, you know, I find myself like, feeling myself becoming just known as that. And I was kind of like, well, I have all these different sides to me that I really want to showcase in my music. And, and what I, I kind of want people to know, like, that's not all I am. So I started to write 
and take that seriously. Probably at like 16, 17, I started to like write my own songs and, you know, get into that more. Um, I began to do a lot of, of co-writing with people. Um, I, I enjoy co-writing so much. Um, I think it's like the best way to, to write songs because you're around other creative minds and you're kind of all coming together to make something really cool. So I enjoy doing that. So yeah, I was like 16, 17 when I, when I began to, to sort of, uh, you know, I wouldn't say I found, I, I, don't, I still wouldn't say I've found my sound yet. I'm still searching for that, but um, you know, it's like, I think I began to, to realize like, okay, th these are the things I want to be focusing on. And, you know, I, I obviously want to be a guitar player and whatever, but the prodigy thing, at a certain time, it's like, you know, I don't know, it's got to go at some point. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but but I totally, uh, you know, respect everybody that that has called me what they've called me over the years. And, and it's gotten me here. So I'm, I'm super thankful. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, Alan, in your book, you also confront some of the biggest misconceptions about children with prodigious talent, including the nature versus nurture debate, and especially the role that their parents play in their achievements. Can you elaborate about that and just sure. talk about it? I don't know how many of the listeners have heard of something called the 10,000 hours myth. Well, they don't call it a myth. The 10,000 hours rule, I call it a myth. Um, and that is that if you spend 10,000 hours on something, you can get to be great at it and anybody can do it. And that the only reason Quinn is so good at age, what are you, 20? I'm 22 now, yeah. Right. At the mere, at the, at the very old age of 22, um, he must have spent 10,000 hours working on this. And that Lori, if you had decided to spend 10,000 hours working on singing instead of gymnastics, you'd be just like Quinn because it's all a matter of hard work. Now, there are a lot of, scientific articles written about this. And the evidence that people base this on is the fact that they take people like Quinn or like Lori, and they ask them to retrospectively figure out how many hours they spent in their whole life on their area. And it's a lot. And so they say, see, it's hard work. Yeah. But of course, Lori chose gymnastics, Quinn chose music, and they weren't randomly assigned to music or gymnastics. There must've been something in their brains that caused them to gravitate towards those areas. And then on top of that, I'm sure there was something in their brains that allowed them to master these areas very quickly. Uh, so I think that anybody that says it's just hard work and it's not innate talent, they're trying to be politically correct and think that everybody can be great. Uh, but they're also um, probably, they've probably never seen a three-year-old like Quinn pick up the guitar and see how atypically he gravitated to it. Because anybody that's seen one of the kids who is like this, if they'd seen Laurie or Quinn as a young child, it would be very hard to say it's all hard work because the very first time they begin in their areas, they're already showing something unusual. So that's one myth that it's all hard work. But another myth is um, related to that. Another myth is that parents are just pushing these kids and that if the parents would stop pushing, they would just be normal kids. And that's not true because of the rage to master because these kids are pushing themselves. It's not just the parents pushing the kids. Now do, it is the case that some parents who have kids like this really do push them hard and they put them on the public stage and they put them on TV quiz shows and the parents are pushing. And sometimes parents push so much that the kids burn out and they hate it. And this happened to Andre Agassi, the tennis player, uh, who said he hates tennis now because his father pushed him so mercilessly. But that doesn't mean he didn't have innate talent to begin with. Mm. Um, another myth, and this is really for academically gifted kids, um, is that they don't need any special educational services. Um, those should go to the kids who have deficits, not who have gifts. The problem with that is the kids who are really talented in math or science or verbal areas are very bored in school if there's no special accommodations made. And there's all kinds of ways of making special accommodations, including giving kids their own independent work to work on. But if you just let these kids alone and do nothing, sometimes they start hating school and tuning out. And then they actually get misdiagnosed as having attention deficit disorder or being slow learners just because they don't like, they don't like being bored in school. 
Um, so there are some other myths too, but those are, those are a few of them. Oh, but I will just say that for people who are gifted in athletics and in music, like the two of you, school doesn't really teach those things anyway. So you all, I'm sure, took private lessons. So when you were in school, you weren't being forced to do really easy music or really easy gymnastics. Or if you were, you didn't really mind because you had these private lessons where you were advanced. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you one more myth. And that is that prodig child prodigies all make it into great uh, geniuses. Now, child prodigies are very gifted kids. They're very precocious. They learn fast. Um, but some prodigies, actually more prodigies than not, I don't want to discourage anybody here, but more prodigies than not actually quit their area of giftedness and do something different. And that's fine. There's no reason why a Quinn or a Lori has to become an adult who does what they did as, at age five. Um, so it's actually an ex the exception. You guys are the exceptions because you were child prodigies and then you went on as adults to do something very unusual in your area. But many prodigies do not, and we never hear about them. Huh. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, and even, so even if the passion, like love, motivation clearly originates from within, um, it's a lot to handle before a young kid can be emotionally ready for that. So the pressure, attention, possibly loneliness at the time, how does that affect the mental health and adjustment of the prodigy child? Yeah. Well, maybe you guys, I'll say something about that. And I'd really love to hear that from the two of you, but um, the more extreme the gift, the harder it is for the child because they, the harder it is for them to find others like themselves. And I always tell parents, the most important thing you can do for your child is to find at least one other child who's like yours, um, because then your child won't feel like such an oddball. <laughs> um, so I think that uh, you mentioned loneliness, Lori. Were you lonely? Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> yes and no. I mean, of course, I had teammates that were kind of in the same group that I was and, and uh. would be competing together. So I had that familiarity and you know, even if I was competing and there were girls that didn't train with me, I still got to see that representation of girls kind of doing that same level that I was. Um, so, I mean, technically, no. <laughs> technically, no. Now, how do we interpret that? <laughs> you shouldn't have been lonely, but you really were. What was that? Does that mean you shouldn't have been lonely, but you really were? Um, yeah, I guess we could go that route. <laughs> okay. But I think as a gymnast, you are on a team. And already then you have other kids like yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And so it definitely lonely in the sense that, um, you know, the paths that you go on a lot of times, especially in trying to get to the Olympics, a lot of girls have that same drive, but the burnout is so quick and so fast yeah, yeah. that I was kind of like on this one path to this one way. And then we had kids like coming along the ride and then dropping off and then a kid would pick up and then come along the ride and drop off. And I was still kind of going and it was really odd to watch. So I was never really lonely, but it wasn't consistent. So it, was it does an sound very stressful though, Lori. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fun, but stressful. Yeah. <laughs> what and about you, Quinn? Did, Quinn, did you find yeah. other kids like you? Um, you know, as I, like, yeah, I was going to say, as I, as I progressed and as I, as I got into this more, um, I did find, yeah, there are some kids that um, I'm actually friends with that have that prodigy title, you know, that they've been called their whole life as well. Um, nobody actually that I know that lives locally, but um, some people that live, um, in, in the United States and stuff I, I, that I've kind of become kind of close with. Uh, yeah. I mean, and I was going to say like, you know, I think at first for me, it was like, this is just really fun and this is like awesome and I love it. And there was really no like, um, this, like crazy thought process or any stress that really was um, involved early on. Um, that started to come as I got older, as I, as I toured more, as I, as I, really under kind of the kind of um, begin to understand how the music business works a little bit more. Um, yeah. You start to, you start to see things. And as you get older, you start to, to see, you know, different people and uh, talk about it. And, and as you get more involved. So, yeah, I mean, um, I, every line of work, you know, there's going to be some stress, you know, I'm sure with gymnastics, I'm sure there's a ton of, can't even imagine what that must be like. It must be high intense training and all of that. And, 
I think a similarity that I have as well is like, yeah, it's like the same thing with music. It's like you're, you're, you're always sort of competing for like your next show, you know, like the show is the competition, you know, and like, if, you know, sometimes, sometimes it works out and other times it, it's, it doesn't work out like the other times, but, um, you know, I've noticed that you kind of just have to persevere, you know, through that. So. But Quinn, when you were a child, under the age of eight, say, did you have anybody else that you could play with who was like you in terms of being very advanced in music or advanced in something? I was, you know, I was always playing with the people that were a lot older than me when I was. That's so typical, right? Yeah, I was playing with with um, with grown men actually. Yeah, when I when I was a kid, I was playing with uh, you know forty and fifty year olds. I mean that that was like, and I also have to mention. Um, a big part of my story and a big part of my career is um, a guy by the name of Buddy Guy taking me under his wing when, when I was eight. And so his, his band obviously were so much older than me. So I, I sort of considered them as kind of my second family because we'd be on the road with them so much. My dad would also come with me, um, obviously, uh, but they weren't, they weren't going to let me fly at, uh, at, at, at 10 years old <laughs> on my own. Uh, so he was always there, but, yeah, I was always hanging around older people. Um, and I guess that didn't really bother me. I mean, I guess I, I probably grew up quicker than other kids my age were growing up um, in some ways. But um, yeah, I never really thought about it too much. I guess I never overthought it. I guess because it was always so normal to me to have just be playing with, you know, not playing with other kids. Um, what about when you went to school? Did you ever have um, play dates with other kids your age? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They just weren't playing music or interested in, in you know, or, or weren't like exceptionally, I guess, good at, at any, like anything abnormal, you know, at the time. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I had a very, you know, a lot of people have the misconception that I had a, uh, this crazy life and this, like, I didn't have a childhood and all this stuff, but I was very lucky and fortunate to have like a normal childhood. I, I, I had like two, I lived like well, I, when I was in school, I lived like two separate lives. Like one life was on the road, doing mm. my thing, you know, having some success. And then the other side was I would go to grade school, middle school, high school, and would just be kind of a normal kid. I always sort of like to blend in with everybody else. I didn't really, you know, it's hard to believe, but I, I don't, unless I'm doing something professionally, I'm not really the type to like be loving the center of attention all the time. So I just kind of, uh, managed to blend in and it was somebody would ask me what I was doing I would I would kind of just uh, you know I was very unassuming in that way mm, yeah that's really interesting and I think it might be the hardest for kids who are gifted in a school area because there they all day long in school they notice how different they are from everybody yeah. else. whereas I could yeah I could yeah I was gonna say I, I could sort of um, yeah because like music was like in school but like it's not like you were talking about like, um, you know, prodigies that are, are drawers or painters. I mean, that's so much like that's so much of a part of school. So um, well, art, yeah. visual arts is not very much a part of school, actually. Yeah. Oh, I guess. Yeah, I guess. you. Yeah, I guess you are right. Music was, is actually more part of school than visual arts, but both of them are on the sidelines. True. Um, fortunately. True. Yeah. Um, well, that's I was that's too. Yeah. <laughs> I it's think good. we're getting a little short on time. So we're going to sneak to the end and run to the lightning round. Um, we do have five rapid fire questions for each of you. Quick answers, 30 seconds for all of them in total. So we're going to do one person at a time and Dr. Winner first, if that's okay. And we'll circle right to Quinn's answers. Okay. Okay. First question. What song or type of music do you turn to when you're feeling down? Ooh. Well, I'm a teen of the sixties. So I probably listen to Joan Baez. Woo. Um, a hobby or activity that helps you unwind and de-stress. Mm, going for a speed walk. If you hadn't chosen your current profession or it hadn't chosen you, what would you be? I think that I would have loved to be a medical researcher. Mm. I am very interested in medicine and I always try to diagnose people whenever they have ailments. <laughs> what is one thing you've never told an interviewer about yourself? Every night I like to escape into a world of fiction, whether it's in a book or in television. I need to escape from this world and go into another one. <laughs> um, the last question um what gives you hope <laughs> right now what's giving me hope is 
President Biden and his wonderful press secretary, Jen Psaki. Yes. 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 I love that. Yeah. Love that. Wow. Um, all right, Quinn, you ready? Ready to go. Let's do it. <laughs> what song or type of music do you turn to when you're feeling down? Uh, type of music I turn to when feeling down would probably be something acoustic. Um, John Mayer, Ed Sheeran, those types of artists are always on rotation, whether I'm happy or sad. But yeah, I definitely turn to them when I'm not feeling so hot. Yeah. Yeah. A hobby or activity that helps you unwind and de-stress? Um, I'd say the same answer as, as Ellen. I, I love going for walks. Um, I think that's a great way to cope with if you're having a, a bad or a stressful day. I mean, that's, that's the best way to do it for me. Yeah. If you hadn't chosen your current profession or it hadn't chosen you, what would you be? Um, maybe a teacher of some sort. You know, I always, I always kind of was, was you know, um, interested, uh, you know, just from seeing my teachers and, and the way they teach. And, and I've had some really uh, great teachers over the years. Uh, maybe teaching, uh, maybe English or even music. You know, I, I think music has always been a part of me and I can't really imagine a life uh, without music. So I think I'd say probably uh, teaching of some sort. Yeah. Yeah. What is one thing you've never told an interviewer about yourself? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, that's a good question. I, I feel like I've, I'm, I'm an open book for the most part. I don't really keep <laughs> that for myself. Uh, Probably that I love, I love, um, let's see. I love like, I really love to get into like a good mob show or movie. I'm really into that kind of stuff. So like, I'm a huge Sopranos fan. Uh, I love like, like Goodfellas and that whole Robert De Niro, Martin Scorsese thing. I love that. So I'm a huge fan of that, so. And our last one, what gives you hope? What gives me hope is uh, seeing people that are doing things for, for the world. You know, I'm really inspired by like Greta Thunberg and uh, yeah, same thing, President Biden and, and hopefully what he'll be able to do for us as a nation and I feel very hopeful, so yeah. Yay. Um, I absolutely love this conversation with you too. Thank you so much, Ellen and Quinn. It has been absolutely wonderful. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Yeah, vice versa, absolutely, this was awesome. It's been great meeting both of you. Yeah, you too. Now for our weekly mental health app review from our team at One Mind Cyber Guide. Hi there, I'm Martha Neary and I'm the project manager of One Mind Cyber Guide. You probably already use your phone for many things throughout the day, but did you know that there are lots of apps out there to help you manage your mental health and well-being? There are thousands of mental health apps available for download today. With so many to choose from, it can be hard to separate the good from the bad. That's where One Mind Cyber Guide can help. At One Mind Cyber Guide, we review apps on three different metrics credibility, user experience, and transparency. We've reviewed over 200 products, and all of these reviews are available for free on our app guide at onemindcyberguide.org. Hi, I'm Stephen Schuler, and I'm the executive director of One Mind Cyber Guide. I'm a clinical psychologist and mental health service researcher, and my research focuses on the use of technology to increase access to mental health care. The work we do at One Mind Cyber Guide is important because there's a need for objective third-party reviews of mental health apps and rigorous evaluation of their evidence base. This week, we're looking at Breathe, Think, Do with Sesame. This interactive game is designed for parents and caregivers to use with children to help them learn skills like problem solving, self-control, and planning. Here's a look at what the app is like. This monster is frowning and his shoulders are all scrunched up. He's feeling frustrated because he tried and tried to put on his shoes, but he just couldn't do it. Tap on the monster's belly to help him put his hands on it. Tap slowly on his belly. Look! The monster is calming down! Yes! He looks much calmer! Great job! You helped the monster take three slow breaths to calm down. Now, he's ready to think about a plan for how to get his shoes on. Pop the bubbles to tell the monster helpful things. 
and think of some plans. Think, think, think. Keep thinking of a plan. You're almost there. <gasps> Look, the monster has an idea. Watch how his sister puts on her shoes so he can remember how to do it himself. On our app guide, Breathe, Think, Do with Sesame has a score of 1.67 out of 5 for credibility and 4.11 out of 5 for user experience. We look forward to seeing you next week for another app review. Thanks, CyberGuide team. Thank you to Quinn Sullivan and Dr. Ellen Winner. Viewers, thank you too. Don't forget, you can post questions and also check out all of our Brainwaves episodes at onemind.org slash brainwaves. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. My mother has had depression uh, most of her life. My uncle committed suicide when he was in his 30s. I live with bipolar. Now more than ever, it's the world's leading cause of disability. Yet research to improve mental health lacks the attention physical health research receives. Visit OneMind.org. From the lab to the front lines, accelerating brain health for all. Help us fund new treatments at OneMind.org.